There's a body of truisms out there that I like to call real estate investing common knowledge. These are the lessons that people read about on forums, hear about on podcasts, watch videos about here on YouTube, and never question. But here's the thing. If you invest in Los Angeles or any other large urban gateway city market, you need to question these truisms because they may keep you from acquiring good investments in your market. Case in point, I was working with a client last week and we were considering a property near Culver City, an area of Los Angeles that's exploded over the past decade, largely fueled by an influx of young tech professionals. It was a good property, but my client, looking at the Redfin listing, said, well, the elementary school ranks a three out of 10. That's not very good. Let's look at something else. Look, I didn't want to get into a long thing with him about why disregarding an otherwise promising property because of the local elementary school's low rating was a bad move. So instead, I'm making a video about it. I'm John Schwartz, a house hacker and realtor in Los Angeles, California. This is House Hack Los Angeles, and today we're exploring a controversial question. Do good schools really matter when investing in Los Angeles? If you ask me, the Midwest orthodoxy on this is dead wrong, and I'll tell you why. All right, let's talk about the logic behind buying rental property near good schools. Good schools attract tenants with kids because parents want to send their kids to good schools. Fair enough. Moreover, good schools attract sticky tenants, i.e. tenants who aren't going to move out. If the tenants have children in the local school, they'll be inclined to stay put until their children are out of school, right? I mean, a good K through eight school could keep a tenant in place for nine years. And what if the tenant has two or three kids? That could be a 12 or 15 year long tenancy. And common knowledge also tells us that turnover kills profits. So 15 years with no turnover is a huge win, right? Maybe in the Midwest, but not in Los Angeles. And this is why we LA investors need to question the common knowledge. Let me explain. Los Angeles is a rent controlled market. In the Midwest and the Southeast and Florida and Texas, you'll find almost no rent controlled markets. In those markets, a landlord can raise rent as much as the market will bear. A new tenant moves in at market rent and 15 years later, that tenant is still paying market rent for a unit of that condition. Not so in Los Angeles. Here in LA, we have a rent stabilization ordinance that limits how much a landlord can raise rent on an existing tenant each year. The allowed increase is tied to the consumer price index, which is a proxy for inflation. For nine of the last 10 years, that allowable increase has been 3%. Rent on an existing tenant can be raised only 3% per year. Over the same period, market rent has grown much faster, sometimes 10% in a year. However, a landlord can only achieve that market rent increase if one tenant moves out and another moves in. Only at vacancy can an LA landlord charge any price they want and achieve what the market will bear. So what does it mean for an LA landlord if market rent is growing faster than rent control allows? Let's say that rent control limits increases to 3%, while market rent is growing at say 5% per year. That's a conservative average for Los Angeles. This graph demonstrates the divergence of market rent and controlled rent over time. The starting point is LA's current median rent, according to rentcafe.com, of $2,355 per month or $28,260 per year. In five years, market rent is 10% higher than controlled rent. In 10 years, the gap is 21%. And in 15 years, market rent is a full third more than controlled rent. In other words, if you're an LA landlord and place a tenant in a median apartment and prevent any turnover over the next 15 years, in year 15, you'll collect $44,000 in rent instead of $59,000. So look, this is not a takedown video about LA's rent control, which actually provides stability in an otherwise very fluid market and I think makes LA a better place. What I am trying to point out is that in LA, you don't want a tenant in place for 15 years. You want tenant turnover every couple of years so that you can restore market rent to the unit. This begs an interesting question. For an LA landlord, what's the ideal length of a tenancy given the costs of a tenant turnover? After all, when one tenant moves out and another moves in, it costs money to clean or renovate the unit, and there's probably some period of vacancy too. To answer this question, we make a model. Investors of all stripes use models to get a sense of possible future outcomes. Real life has too many variables and too much random chance for anybody to know what's going to happen. But by eliminating variables that aren't germane to the question at hand and simplifying variables that are, an investor can use a model to inform his or her choices. So here's our model to determine the ideal length of tenancy in Los Angeles. As before, we'll start with the current median rent of $2,355. In our model, 
Whenever there is a tenant turnover, we'll say it costs the landlord $1,500 to prepare the unit for the next tenant, and that there's one month of vacancy between tenants. So those are our simplified variables, a $1,500 make ready cost and a month of vacancy between tenants. The question is, what turnover rate is most beneficial to the landlord? To answer this, we plug different turnover rates into our model, then tallied up the cumulative income over 15 years. On the one hand, let's look at an example with no tenant turnover. A tenant moves into the unit at $2,355 per month. There's no turnover, so there are no make ready costs or vacancy, and rent is increased 3% per year. Over 15 years, the cumulative gross rent from the unit will be $525,605. On the other end of the spectrum, let's say the same unit sees turnover every single year. Rent starts at $2,355, increases 5% to the new market rent every year with each year's new tenant, but also incurs a month of vacancy and a $1,500 make ready cost every year. In 15 years of this scenario, the cumulative gross rent from the unit will be $540,348. So right off the bat, using the model we created, turnover every year is better in Los Angeles than no turnover at all. Is that the sound of common knowledge being utterly destroyed? But what's the ideal length of tenancy in Los Angeles? The chart we're looking at now shows the cumulative gross income over a 15 year period of a rental unit that experiences turnover from once a year to once every two years to once every three years, etc all the way to no turnover over the whole 15 year period. As you can see, the ideal length of tenancy of a rental unit in Los Angeles, based on our model, is four years. Over a 15 year period, if the unit turns every four years, it should generate $578,076 in gross income, the highest of the different turnover rates analyzed. Looking at the graph more broadly, you can see that the three to six year turnover rates provide the best return, a two-year turnover rate, as well as seven through nine years between turnovers, also provides a good return. But once a unit is turning over every nine years or more, your returns really start to tumble. So what does this have to do with good schools? Look, I'm not saying you should avoid investing near good schools, though I might say that in part two of this conversation, so subscribe to the House Hack Los Angeles channel above and see that next week. What I am saying is that the quality of the local public school shouldn't matter if you're trying to target that three to six year turnover sweet spot. Because who stays in an apartment for three to six years? Families? No. Young professionals stay in apartments for three to six years. If you're looking at an investment property near Culver City or any other trendy, gentrifying urban part of Los Angeles, your ideal tenant is a young professional in their late 20s with enough disposable income to afford a good apartment, but not enough to buy a house. You wanna provide a home to that young professional for the next three to six years, at which point he or she will have enough disposable income to buy a house and you'll find a new young professional to put in the unit at market rent for another three to six years. To put it simply, the quality of the local public school has nothing to do with it. But don't take my word for it. Look, until 2019, I lived for a decade in Echo Park, a neighborhood that gentrified immensely in the time I lived there and is now an absolute hotbed of development. Why is Echo Park so hot? Well, it's between downtown LA and Hollywood, two big employment centers where you find a lot of offices. But more importantly, Echo Park is cool. Some of the best new bars, restaurants, coffee shops, concert venues, and clothing stores in LA are in Echo Park. And while the neighborhood was pretty affordable a decade ago, now it's pretty expensive because it's become so cool. So developers want in on those high rents and they're building new apartment buildings like crazy. But guess what Echo Park doesn't have? You guessed it, good schools. Logan Street Elementary, which covers kindergarten through eighth grade, scores a two out of 10 at greatschools.com. And the high school Belmont, comes in at three out of 10. So all I'm saying is, if you pass on a good deal near Echo Park or Culver City or other LA neighborhoods like these because the school ratings are low, well then you're not paying attention to what the professional LA investors are doing. Next week in part two of this conversation, we're going to discuss the specifics of Los Angeles property taxes, school funding, and why good schools actually do not correlate with good investments. It's kind of crazy. Subscribe to the channel now so you don't miss it. If you're still watching, please hit the like button, subscribe, and let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm John Schwartz, and this is House Hack Los Angeles.